born into those uh Good morning, uh, everyone, for those in uh, uh, Australia and Asia. Uh, good early good morning for those in uh, Europe and uh, Middle East. And uh, for those in Northern America and Southern America, good evening. Um, we're here for Virtual Global Spine again. Uh, and today I am absolutely delighted to introduce Professor Neil Dougal, Professor of Neurosurgery, Western University in London, Ontario, Canada. And he has a keen interest in cervical disc replacement and really in some of the biomechanics surrounding it uh, and what we can do with these devices. Now, I also have a keen interest and we were just chatting off air before about this. Uh, it seems like Neil falls in, in my school of thought. I've been a cautious adopter of TDR. I think there really is something in it. Uh, as a surgeon that does a lot of redos, revision surgery, I, I, I think I hope we can do better than our um, fusion in the future. You know, I think we all say, oh, it's the gold standard in neck surgery. I think there are some studies that, that do cast a bit of doubt on that when you look at some long-term patient outcomes. We have to recognize the bias in those studies as well. Uh, and perhaps the truth uh, uh, is not always gained from industry things and, and real life studies are suggestive that maybe results are similar for single level. But you know, to me, when you look at this, uh, I think we see a lot of patients with multi-level disease. Um, at least in my practice, uh, you know, single-level pathology is uh, is actually not that common. Um, I think we need to look at what devices we can use in a range of different situations, and uh, and for that reason, uh, I've got a real interest in what Neil's going to talk about today. Uh, he's going to talk about alignment correction in CDTR. As always, got a few of the faculty here. We will monitor the chat box to keep you uh, keep your questions flowing. Um, Neil, uh, we are going to um, interrupt every now and again with questions as we go. So we'll try not to disturb your flow too much. Uh, and uh, without me uh, babbling on too much, I'll, I'll let you get started. I can see your screen well. Thank you. Okay. Mike, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give this talk. I'm just going to try to move this to a spot that doesn't uh, interfere. Well, um, just gonna... well, I, I'd like to start with some disclosures. Um, I, our hospital receives funding from Medtronic, J&J, uh, &J, and Stryker. I'm a director and CMO for Synergy Spine Solutions, and I do teaching on behalf of Medtronic. That's interesting. Um, this is Western University where I work. Um, it's a small university town, about 500,000. It drains about 2.2 million people. And uh, I've been here now for 23 years. And um, very early on in my career, um, I had a unique opportunity. I was um, the first person in North America to do a cervical TDR. That was two years after I started practice. I was uh, 36 years old. And I uh, had this opportunity and I had spent a lot of time during my fellowship uh, in biomechanics. I, I didn't possess anything special apart from that I'm a fairly detail oriented person. And I think they wanted to have somebody that do the, did the first case to do it by the books and follow the, the very long list of procedural steps for the, for the Brian disc. And this was an incredible opportunity for me in my career. Uh, very early on, I was, um, you know, uh, I decided to tackle this. I'm at a university. I decided to tackle this in many different directions. And yeah, you know, this was the first case I did. This patient had a focal uh, small disc herniation causing radiculopathy, refractory to conservative therapy. I did this disc and my eyes were wide open. I, I had, you know, I, it just was a unbelievable experience for someone early in their career. Um, I started at that point teaching other surgeons how to do it. I embraced it totally. I started doing biomechanical studies uh, in collaboration where I did my fellowship in Phoenix uh, at the at the Barrow Neurological Institute. I was really doing imaging studies. I was really trying to understand this from every different direction I could. And unfortunately, somewhere along that path, I had this case. Sorry. 
Um, this is a patient who came in and had a nice cervical lordosis, had focal disease. While the patient was lying supine, the end plates of the implant looked great. But unfortunately, six weeks after surgery, the patient came into my office and had incapacitating neck pain. You can see the focal kyphosis, kissing end plates of the implant. You can see the splaying of the facets. You can see the splaying of the spinous processes. It took weeks and weeks of physiotherapy, massage, all these non-surgical measures. I really didn't know how to handle this, and I didn't know what I had done wrong. I had done every case the same way. So at that point, I uh, I took it to the industry that uh, the industry partner that had now acquired this implant. And I asked them, you know, what did I do wrong? They said, no, it's your technique. It just so happened that I was speaking to Mike earlier that my brother was <clears throat> um, in, in doing his fellowship and I went to Australia and I gave a talk to the Australian Spine Society and I showed these films. And out of the woodwork, people started coming saying, I'm having the same problem. It's not just the Brian disc, it's the any disc kind of a ball and socket. So that was really the genesis of my journey, so to speak. Uh, I had this problem of alignment. When we do everything I learned in my fellowship and subsequently in spinal surgeries, after you do the decompression, you reconstruct the alignment. Why didn't this apply to a cervical disc herniation or a cervical disc uh, TDR? So that was really the, the point where I started trying to understand. And, um, if you look at the authors carefully here, there's Bill Sears, there's Lali Sakon. With these um, group of Australian surgeons, we set out to describe the problem of alignment, and we thought we were pretty clever, and then we started seeing numerous papers come out. Everybody was experiencing the same issue of alignment, um, so much so that the Cleveland Clinic came up with this you know, management algorithm. If somebody has alignment problems, do a fusion. If somebody has a perfect alignment, do an consider an arthroplasty. Uh, editorials came out uh, in the Spine Journal. The maintenance of motion is achieved at the cost of the induction of kyphosis in the vast majority of patients. The clinical relevance of retained motion versus induced kyphosis must be considered carefully. All of a sudden, I started to really question what I was doing and if I was doing the right thing. I looked at my own cases in 2004, and after this case of alignment issues, it, it vastly changed the way I was managing patients. So in 113 single or double level cases, I did 45 TDRs and 68 fusions. It became apparent to me that if I had a straight spine or a focal reducible kyphosis, if I did a cervical TDR, I had a unpredictable result. And that was really the biggest concern I had. If someone had a normal cervical lordosis, the chances of ruining that lordosis and causing focal kyphosis was fairly low. But if someone had a straight or focal kyphosis, which is 50% of the patients we see, there was a risk of unpredictable results. And, and for that reason, I you know, really cut down the number of arthroplasties I was performing. So I started to, you know, wonder, you know, how to solve this issue. And, and so I'll, I'll run through a few scenarios. W one scenario is, is, you know, a technique. Um, maybe I'm not placing the device in the right spot. Maybe I'm not preparing the end plates properly. Um, maybe positioning on the OR table, or alternatively, look at the, the device. You can get some restoration of alignment with just simply restoring disc height. Lordotic end plates were um, being commonly used in lumbar arthroplasty and you know the Discover disc from J&J, &J, which Scientex, the Simplify have lordotic end plates. And then of course, how about a lordotic core? So the, you know, if you have a metal poly metal sandwich, how about the core? Could it be lordotic? So here's an example of alignment correction with a ball and socket. 
So you might look at this on first blush and say, hey, you know, I re I created lordosis. This is, uh, I've solved the issue here of lordosis. The problem is, is that unfortunately, this is a neutral, these are neutral films, one image stabilized on top of the other. This is a medical metrics wizardry, at, you know, um, and what this shows is that if you start analyzing the movement between neutral and extension, there's no movement or relatively nothing, 1.2 degrees. All the movements happening from neutral to flexion. And as we started to analyze these patients that you could, you know, I call pseudo lordosis, you realize that those are the patients that ultimately fused along the back end. These implants were meant to be parallel. They're not meant to be jackknifed. And so, um, you know, one of my very, very brilliant residents uh, looked at this. I teamed up with Rudy Bertinoli and, and we looked at, you know, these patients that were jackknifed in a hyperlordotic um, orientation with the pro disc. And we found that there was very, they, they would sacrifice motion and ultimately would sacrifice, um, they, they would fuse. So I don't think that's the right solution. The other solution I've heard people talk about is, you know, put the disc anteriorly. The problem with, a, say, a typical ball and socket is, is that you need to push the disc all the way back if you want to get the centers of rotation. So this is the center of rotation preoperatively. So the more anterior you kind of place your implant with the hope of creating lordosis, the more you're moving away from the natural centers of rotation of the vertebral body. And that's particularly true for a ball and socket type of geometry where there's a fixed center of rotation. So then, you know, you have, you have some master carpenters and they can make everything look good. So let's, for example, look at C4, C5 and look at the end plates. It's parallel end plates. You can distract the end plates. You can use your carpentry skills to do an asymmetrical cut. You can put the implant in, and now you've created lordosis. Problem is, is it's just not perfectly reliable. And the average surgeon doesn't, doesn't have the skill set to do this day in, day out, and get re reliable, predictable, and reliable results. If you if you're doing that type of maneuver and you overmill the front end of the, the vertebral body, you're going to have the counter problem. You're going to create kyphosis. So, and the other thing is it requires a lot of drilling. And we've come to look, believe that too much drilling of the end plates can certainly cause or you know accelerate HO. So this is a this is a simple technique. You know, when we do a, we can reduce a, you know grade one slip and just by jacking up height. And similarly, you can do that with the disc replacement. You can jack up the height and you can get a nice correction. Um, and, and, and here, the, the implant's perfectly placed. Again, this is not 100% reliable. Sometimes it works well, and sometimes it doesn't. Now, lordotic end plates. So this gave a lot of thought of it to this because this is the obvious solution, right? We see this all the time. So say you had a six degree space. You put a bone socket in. It's that problem I described earlier. You have this unequal movement or motion. So you have nothing from neutral to extension and all of the movements from neutral to flexion. But if you had lordotic end plates in that six, and you say three degrees and three degrees, it works perfect. No problem. Or you could put a, a device with a six degree core and that will equally work well. But 50% of our patients plus, actually the literature suggests 60%, have either parallel end plates or focal kyphosis. In that setting, you can put your ball and socket in. It won't correct alignment, but it should work well. You could put a zero degree implant in, but if you put the lordotic end plates in, you're gonna get this kyphosis. And this is why the Discover trial, that was the J&J &J disc where they had lordotic, lordotic end plates. That's why they abandoned that implant. It never came to market because they were just seeing too much of these lordotic end plates. Of course, if you wanted to really jack it up, you would need some type of force. And that's where 
you know, I'm going to talk a little bit more about putting the, the alignment into the core or into the polyethylene, where you can now get an, a correction from a zero degree to a six degree. So as, as we could identify that this, this, the strategy was really to get the best of both worlds. You, with fusion, we, we use allograft or we use cages. We have lordosis built into that. We have lordosis built into our cage. So after we decompress, we use our carpentry skills to, to get great sagittal alignment. The first generation of implants provided, you know, you did the decompression and provided great motion, but they really didn't incorporate that alignment feature. And that's where I'm going to talk a lot about the synergy disc because that's obviously an area that I've, you know, I've dedicated a good part of my career trying to understand. And and it was trying to get the alignment in a ball in in a in a arthroplasty device. And remember, most joints are, you know, premised on a ball and socket. Why? Because it works well. They're congruent services, uh, low wear debris. I mean, time tested. So now all of a sudden you're thinking, you have to think a little bit. If a ball and socket is great for the hip, is it great for the neck? Because we get a normal cervical lordosis because every disc gives us about seven degrees of angle. So the anterior disc height, if you look at healthy discs, is greater than the posterior disc height. So in fact, a healthy disc is more of a wedge. It's not parallel end plates. Otherwise, you would have a straight spine. You get each, each segment gives you lordosis. And so the synergy disc has a number of features that through my experience, with arthroplasty, we try we try to incorporate, and so this is the personal journey. Um, it's unique because it incorporates six degrees of alignment in the polyethylene. In my hands, you know, Mike said earlier about most of the cases being multi-level. Well, when I with the first generation of implants, what happened, I would notice anyway, was one implant would work really well and the other one really didn't do much. And uh, I think the lingo I heard somebody at a talk goes, at a talk said, well, one implant is a slave to the other. And uh, so we wanted to have a device that really addressed that. All contemporary de devices need to be MRI compatible but also put in safety stops. If you ever take a pro disc and play with it, one end plate will, can just ride off the other. Um, there had to be something inherent to the implant that gave it some sa safety. And, and by doing this, prevent complications. So this is so simple, it's, it's kind of um, very obvious. But if you take a ball, say, say we take a marble, this blue marble that I've put here, and um, patient's lying down, everything is fine. The patient gets up and takes the weight of their head. That's 70 Newtons. If that force is right down the middle, the marble will not may not move, but more likely than not, it's gonna move forward or backwards because it's a marble and it's on your desk and it's gonna roll the minute you push down on it. But how about if you shaved off the bottom of the marble? Now the marble is gonna rest on your desk. The minute you push down on it, you're going to get to a certain energy and it's going to roll forward or roll backwards. And really that was the solution, was to take a marble and pull it apart. The minute you pull it apart, you can introduce angle into it. So the very first implants were zero, three, six, nine, 12, we had all, you know, a huge family of, of angles in there. And we started to show this to surgeons and they said, well, we can't see the difference between a three and a six or a six and a nine. We want either a zero or a six. And so, you know, uh, I'm just going to move this over here, but it was basically taking, flattening out, creating a flat area on the sagittal and then a flat in the coronal. And by doing this, now you could jack in alignment, either in the coronal or sagittal plane. 
So, you know, I was telling Mike earlier that my brother is an orthopedic surgeon. And when I showed this to him, he said, well, you know what, that would be great because a good number of people I, I do ankle fusions on, I have to do it that way because they don't have a good alignment to begin with. And alignment's everything. And, um, you know, this is for a neurosurgeon, this was you know, a neurosurgeon near the end of his career. This was kind of new stuff that I was learning. So um, I'm still learning how to use the computer here. Okay. Um, so it, the goal of the synergy disc was really threefold. Number one, I want to, I don't ever want to see post-operative kyphosis in my, in my, in my cases. I have every patient I, I do, they take out their camera. They want to take a picture of it. No, thanks. I don't, I think that's a complication that we should be able to solve. Number two, I wanted to, to find a predictable and reliable way of treating patients with focal reducible kyphosis and whether they were straight and you know literature says up to you know 50 to 60 percent of our patients are that and finally to design not something for a multi single level use that's then used for multi-level but to design it from the get-go for multi-level because you identified it correct mike the average number of levels treated in the united states is two so single level cases are not that common so here are three different spines with cervical. Can I, interrupt, you, can I interrupt you there while we're talking about sure. it? Because I, I want to get time to, uh, to, we may not get time to talk about it later, but sure. I know you would have seen the most recent trials that have mm -hmm. come out, which are mm -hmm. independent trials, showing that there is no real difference between CDA or fusion for a single level Yeah, yeah. at five years. Now, Knowing how those trials would have been done, I think one was five, maybe one was 10, but knowing how those trials were done, I would have anticipated that um, maybe that they had a very tight patient selection for that TDR group as well. Uh, but yes. they're probably using more of an unconstrained type implant is what I believe. So, I mean, do you, what do you think of those trials compared to say other trials like the MOBC trial, which showed dramatically different results? Do you have any comment on that? Well, I I think, you know, th these implants really shine in multi-level cases. I think they shine in hybrid scenarios. Um, on the single level, you're right. Uh, I guess if you've been in practice for long enough, you, you do see these cases come back. And I, I certainly, I, you know, I've read the Hildre Hildebrand paper as we all have. And I don't know that I've encountered that kind of rate of return in terms of, you know, at 10 years, 25% of people have problems, but Certainly, when you do, when they do come back, it's 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 quite dramatic, and usually they have a, a large disc herniation, and somehow they, I, I, it, it, it feels like it's preventable. I think the hard part here is there's people that don't believe in disc replacement, and I don't think there's anything I can say today that will make them believe in it. The the the, the I think you have to conceptually get your head around it, and if you if you think this is, um. I mean, the same thing applies to now spinal endoscopy. You know, there are people that that have been in practice for 25 years and said, look, I can do a micro disc and it takes me a short period of time. Why would I, what's the advantage? I don't do spinal endoscopy, but I can clearly see that there, there will be an advantage over time. And so, uh, you know, the literature is, these are not superiority. To, uh, these are, you know, these are safety trials. Um, they don't look at, many of them don't look at alignment or any of the things that you as a spine surgeon would most definitely be looking at. Most of them are based on an NDI. That's how they're really evaluated. And you know, and I know that's a complete function of, a complete function of the decompression. So, you know, at five years out, the adjacent segment disease, the rate, uh, you know, some are low, some are higher. But I think, as you pointed out, multi-level hybrid cases, I think there's a clear benefit here. There's certain patients that just have this domino effect. And if you can stop it or slow it down with a disc replacement, I think you're doing them, you know, the right thing. Hope that answered the question, Mike. Um, so, you know, here, here, here are three spines, these three surgeons from around the world, three different implants, the Brian, Protus, the Prestige with um, now this is more contemporary implants, the Moby C, um, the M6. The Synergy disc 
has been designed with a zero and a six. Now, with the 2,800 plus, now close to 3,000 worldwide implants, I want to say over 95% of them have been six degrees. Asking a spinal surgeon about alignment is, is, is very innate to them, and they understand it immediately. There's been four publications, uh, 10 plus years of history. Uh, it's being sold in, in, um, in Europe. In fact, it's a second, uh, second, it has second largest market share in Australia. So um, the single level uh, trial in the United States has been completed and a double level trial is being conducted. This was the first case done in 2009. Immediately, you can see the anterior discite is greater than the posterior discite. This is the same patient. This is a medical metrics. Uh, two years later, going through flexion and extension. So the second group of patients is this zero, either you know a straight spine or focal kyphosis. How can we get achieve predictable, reliable results with this group? So um, this is uh, compliments of Dr. Buckland in Australia. It's a very interesting case. He demonstrates um, focal kyphosis at the index level. There's a, a soft disc herniation. Here are his intraoperative pictures. So he's done both uh, some positioning. I don't know if he used traction. He has he's put in his his pins fairly parallel. And here's his post-operative films. And this is I don't think I could show more perfect films. He's 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 got he's he's uh, definitely reduced that area the focal uh, kyphosis at the index level. The implant looks well seated. It's dead midline. I, I just couldn't show us a, a, a better set of films. There's another more challenging uh, case with uh, advanced degenerative changes. If you look at C4, C5, um, you can see a focal kyphosis and some, some degree of translation. I'd like to ask the panel, um, how would you handle this case in your practice. Okay, I think the can the the panel is stumped. So I'll I'll um I'll give you the answer. So <laughs> there is a, a focal. Hey, Neil, I, oh, I could jump in. I could jump in, Neil. <laughs> okay. um, so so look, I'll I'll run down a little bit real quick of what I do with a case like this. So um the focal kyphosis, multi-level disease, I'm looking to see, is there a um, uh, kind of uh, uh, small or um, uh, thing I can do on um, uh, a focal level? And uh, I do use flexion extension radiographs. I use CT scan. I use bone scan with SPECT. Um, and I really try to make a decision, are the facets okay for a TDR? Uh, is there a lot of calcification in your know, PLL or other structures? Uh, you know, so, I mean, the alignment looking at this to me does not prevent a, a TDR being done, but I think it shouldn't be your first TDR either. Um, this is not something that I would be um, uh, able to um, uh, do, you know, a few years back, definitely. Um, and uh, Arvind on the chat has also said, mm -hmm. yeah, CT scan, Bit more information and go for TDR. I don't know if you use bone scans. Um, I'm I'm pretty paranoid about TDRs, so I do because I'm just trying to check out the facets and I don't want to miss the case, you know, right. of terrible facets. And from doing a lot of bone scans before potential TDRs, what I've found is that there is often a, a quite an active upper cervical facet arthropathy for a, a number of these patients with a combination of radiculopathy and axial neck pain. And that's again why I wonder if TDR is a bit more helpful than fusion. I think we've all got patients that we fused five, six, and six, seven on, and they've come back with intractable axial neck pain from an upper facet radiculopathy uh, down the track. So, so yeah, that's uh, uh, yeah. I think for me, I would be comfortable looking at a TDR for this, but often I go into theater with both devices available, and it does depend on those other other um, uh, investigations. 
Th thanks, Mike. That's I don't think I use bone scans enough. Um, after hearing that, I'll definitely consider it. Um, I use it on the very questionable patients, but maybe I should use it more routinely. Um, that, that's exactly my process, apart from the bone scans. Uh, the flexion extensions are pivotal in my decision making. I need to see good motion. Uh, I if it's bone on bone and it's almost fused, I'm not going to revise it and put a disc replacement in. More likely than not, I'm, I will consider it already fused. I'm a fairly conservative surgeon, I, I must admit. I know my colleagues are revising previous fusions and, and getting great results. So, uh, you know, there's a focal kyphosis here. Now, what you're seeing here are two standing upright x-rays, one superimposed on the other. So this is not the patient moving their head. This is simply the impact of the disc on the patient's alignment. And this is the same patient two years later going through flexion and extension. So the next kind of pillar to, to tackle was, you know, multi-level cases. And here you can see, this is one of the first, this was the first multi-level case that we did in 2009. And you can see fairly advanced disease at 5.6 and 6.7, fairly collapsed. And this is right, right in the, um, in the um, uh, recovery room when the patient's wearing a soft collar. That was the surgeon's protocol. You can see the immediate correction and how the implant creates this lordotic configuration at these two levels. And what was important when we started analyzing these films were that both of them provide, both discs provided approximately the same amount of alignment correction with approximately the same amount of movement. And, and that was really one of the things that we wanted to see in this implant was to have this balanced movement um, and hopefully not see this situation where one is a slave to the other. Hey, uh, Neil, can I stop you there? Sure. Um, Moment. I've used a little bit of synergy. I've used so many different TDI devices, um, a never-ending search for the perfect one. But I don't think there is for a number of reasons, but I I'm been pretty happy with the synergy to date. These uh, x-rays are a bit reassuring for me in that often you do see a little gap between where those keels are and the end plate at the top. And I've followed the patients down the line and I've seen them sort of growing bone in at the margin, you know, uh, like an orthopedic surgeon looking at that bone growing in so there's, you know, the, you know, when you get, yeah. uh, when you start doing, looking uh, at things, you become a, come, it's, go uh, ahead. That's what I'm at. Sorry, Mike, uh, I'll, uh, I'll continue, but that, that little gap. So, you know, no, no, uh, okay. I'll tell you why you see that gap and, uh, why we designed it that way. So, um, if you look at, for example, at the M6, they stagger their teeth. So you can't see a gap. If there is a gap, you won't see it. We actually did it purposely. So if there is a gap and you're concerned or you see some shift or the gap is widening, then you know there's an issue with the acute stabilization of the case. The self-biting teeth, I mean, a lot of the surgeons, I'll talk a little bit about technique afterwards, but the way we designed it was is that we, a lot of times there's a con. So the first, and I, I didn't put this in the talk, but initially there was a bit of a concavity, like there's a bit of a dome on our implant. And we had tiny little teeth. I, I want to say very close to the Moby C type of configuration. But we found when we put a domed implant, if you had a flat end plate, now you've got teeter totter. So you had to have a perfect fit with the dome and the end plate to avoid any what we call toggle or, or movement in the short term. So that's why we went from tiny little teeth, distract it, open it up, and then versus what we have now. And quite frankly, I think I would rather make you work a little harder for five more minutes in the operating room than risk having a migration or have a problem with tiny teeth that don't um, bite the bone. So I, I'm I'm great to it's great to hear I, I've I've followed these cases very well as well I've I've done my own but I also have the luxury of of seeing other people and their films and it does fill in that little gap. Um, this is a case done in Australia. One of the things that 
uh, became apparent, uh, and it's it's obviously exacerbated in the lumbar spine. But when you when you're dealing with a ball and socket geometry, you need to line up those centers of rotation one on top of the other. And if you don't, um, you can create obvious alignment issues, but also you can accentuate or accelerate wear and change the way the implant's supposed to behave. And we see it you know, obviously because of the loads in the lumbar spine, but you know this paper out of um, Korea showed that with the Mobi C, the minute you take it one millimeter or two millimeters off axis in the coronal or sagittal plane, that has an impact on the alignment of the end plates. I mean, that's intuitive, right? You're, again, it's a, a marble or ball and socket geometry. So the minute you go off midline, you're going to change the coronal alignment and the sagittal alignment. And whether that's the Mobi C or the ProDisc or the Bryan or the Prestige, or, you know, it, it, all these, when you're doing multi level cases, if it's not dead midline, um, it can be problematic. So what we developed with this, because you know, I, if you go back to, to earlier the discussion about that planar section, um, I know that I'm not perfect in the operating room every time I go in there. And so what we developed is we call it a, a tolerance zone. So in the coronal or sagittal plane, you can be off by two millimeters anterior. So this is, for example, the sagittal or two millimeters posterior. And you have that flat zone. Whereas if you had a ball and socket, the one millimeter you go off, you're going to get a little bit of angling of the plate, two millimeter, millimeters. So for the synergy, you can be two millimeters and the end plates are going to be perfectly parallel. Even if you're off to the right and the other implants off to the left, as long as it's not too far off, the end plates are going to be parallel. And you're going to avoid this issue of fish mouthing when things are off center. Here are just a few cases. Uh, this was done, uh, our first case done in England. Um, the surgeon had previously put in two M6 cases, uh, implants. Uh, a number of years later, the patient came back with disease below. You can see that there's a collapse of the disc base and uh, the level below was also symptomatic. This, this, the surgeon cited a number of reasons which I thought interesting. <clears throat> number one, he said that, you know, this is um, the large M6 is 16 millimeters and this was a large male. And he said he just didn't get enough end plate coverage as he had hoped. And secondly, I guess the, the alignment at the, at the index level was less than ideal. So this was, I mean, I'm sorry, these are just intraoperative pictures, but you can see here, this is a large synergy case, which is which has 18 millimeters AP depth. And you can see the immediate correction from here to here. This was done in Germany where they did a skip lesion to avoid, uh, they avoided an asymptomatic level. This was done in Australia. The surgeon cited safety stops. So if, with the Synergy disc, if you put it in your hand, you'll notice that there's hard on soft stops in every motion plane. The end planes can't ride off, uh, you know, um, above and beyond. So uh, this, this is a large lever arm and the surgeon decided to use the disc. Um, this case, another uh, interesting case where um, the patient had uh, at the adjacent level, 11 degrees of movement and 16, almost 17, 17 degrees of movement at the index level preoperatively and 2.7 millimeters of translation. And we, uh, he, surgeon chose this implant because of the safety stops and he was able to tone down that amount of, uh, I believe, excessive range of motion and translation. This is another case done in Germany. Again, very intraoperative pictures. I think it just speaks to how comfortable the the uh, surgeons are with the implant uh, under, I would say, extremely challenging cases. Um, the implant's been studied uh, quite extensively. Uh, Neil Crawford at the Barrow, um, Lisa Ferreira, um, Vijay Gold did FEA analysis, looking at the motion, how it compared to ball and sockets, and the prestige disc is uh, ball and trough. 
Clinical studies have come out of Turkey where the initial clinical pilot was performed uh, up to actually now 24 months showing clinical outcomes. Really um, a function of brilliant surgeons uh, performing uh, excellent decompressions. A study has been done looking at how alignment with the disc with the TDR compares with an alignment with a plate and allograft. And uh, they found essentially that the uh, synergy disc was uh, better at preserving alignment than the um, than the allograft and plate. Um, a comparative study has been done with um, twenty patients of Prodis, twenty Brian, twenty Synergy, twenty Prestige, and what they found was is that typically the Prodis would give you one degree of lordosis, the Brian you'd lose a couple of degrees, so kyphosis. Prestige again. I guess what you should notice here is the error bars are pretty wide. So that's the unpredictability factor here. With the synergy, we got roughly six degrees with fairly tight error bars. When we looked at the movement, there was no statistical difference across uh, all these implants. So um, for those that don't know, uh, this is these are titanium end plates. There's a plasma spray. These are, we call them, it's a you know, running joke, we call them teals. It's not a tooth, it's not a keel, it's kind of a hybrid. Um, inside, the, what the poly is uh, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, very traditional materials, time tested materials. The secret sauce I've already described to you is the polyethylene and how lordosis is built into it. Here, a little bit about the biomechanics of the implant. Flexion extension happens on the top. Here is the normal center of rotation, one standard deviation, two standard deviation. That's where the synergy disc is. If, for example, you took the pro disc, it's in the center of the ball. That's why when you do a pro disc case or something with a fixed center of rotation, like a typical ball and socket, you need to push it all the way back because you're trying to replicate that center of rotation. We took a unique perspective on lateral bending and axial rotation. So when we mapped out normal centers of rotation for lateral bending, it's actually in the superior part of the disk space. So this is one standard deviation, this is two. Lateral bending and axial rotation happen on the inferior surface. So we've separated motion planes with the synergy and that's why our center of rotation is here versus the traditional ball and socket would be in the middle of the ball in the inferior vertebral body. Here's just some examples. So this is the preoperative center of rotation, the pink dot, and now you can see postoperatively the, the center of rotation is fairly well matched. Flexion extension happens on the top. Translation happens on the top. So in this instance, there's no cross pattern wear. Flexion extension and translation all happen on one surface. And here's just an example of a, of a, of a intraoperative film showing flexion extension and translation. Lateral bending happens on the inferior surface, as does axial rotation. By doing this, we avoid cross pattern wear. So cross pattern wear is when if you draw an X, uh, keep doing it over and over, you'll wear out the point of intersection. So in a typical ball and socket, you flexion extension, you create wear, and then you wipe it off with lateral bending. Whereas in our implant, the, the synergy implant, flexion extension happens here and lateral bending happens here. And that's why we can create a stability zone in the coronal and sagittal planes because they're happening, they're happening on different surfaces. Um, I'm nearing the end. Um, so there's a family of implants. There's a five millimeter and a six millimeter. We started with the small, medium, large. For people that are thinking about using it just to give you, just to give some clarification, a five millimeter implant will be, if you use a six degree implant, will be five millimeters through the center of rotation. So 4.8 from the back, 5.9 from the from the front. If that's why if you're using a six millimeter, it's almost seven from the front. In most instances, this would be too much. You're overstuffing the joint. 
technique is fairly simple. I'm going to show you how I do it. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, I love one of the nice things I've had the opportunity is I've managed to go around the world seeing talented surgeons um, do these cases. And I've tried to pick up something from each one of them. So this is a simple technique. You trial, um, you can pilot cut internationally. Uh, many, I would say most of our surgeons are not cutting the bone, um, but uh, there are certain select geographies that do load and, and insert. So some of the things that I've learned by watching others and, and kind of learning this, this is patient was too old for an arthroplasty, but I, I took this picture because I used to use, um, and I used to use a towel roll and I would tight, you know, just kind of crimp it up really tight and put it underneath the neck. And I, I noticed that when I was tapping the implant or doing a keel cut, the neck would kind of move. And so you wouldn't really be moving forward. I put this firm bean bag and then you can, you can hook it up to suction and it makes it very firm. And by doing this, it, it really makes it much easier to implant the implant, uh, the device. Few things I do, I, I check the midline. So I'll, I have a tiny little washer, that sterile washer. I'll put it in, I'll check my midline, I'll mark my midline, and then I'll put my posts in the midline so I can always keep reference. After I've elevated the longest coli, sometimes it's not easy, not entirely obvious to know exactly where the midline is. I try to put my post in the top ear, the superior one third of the superior vertebral body and the inferior one third of the inferior in, vertebral body. Uh, this is probably the most important slide. Um, when you're putting these implants in, it was designed specifically to get the maximum end plate coverage and to rest on that hard bone. But if you don't take off the medial part of the uncus, you're gonna have a struggle putting in this or the M6 or any other device. So um, I know that there's a lot of surgeons that say, don't, don't drill, don't drill. Um, I think I've come full circle. I, I, when I started, I maybe used the drill too much. Then there was a period where I didn't use the drill at all. <clears throat> but now I, I drill this before I take the PLL down, I do all my drilling. So I drill this, I irrigate it, I bone wax it. And I believe that if you can achieve better end plate coverage, wider end plate coverage, the chance of AO uh, HO is 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 uh, is lower than putting a smaller implant in. The other thing I do is I take down this you know little bit of bone. So if you're putting that implant in, if you're using the cutter, you'll go into bone, out of bone, and then into bone. And this last little part, I take a drill and I just flatten that out. And again, I bone wax it and, and I take all the precautions. All my patients have two weeks of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. I was speaking to Todd Landman and he said that, you know, what he does to just ensure the disc, every disc goes in well and easily is he takes the drill and he just, he says, dust the end plate, which he doesn't go after this middle part, but he'll dust the end plate here and the end plate here and the end plate here and a little bit at the front. And it just ensures a seamless insertion of the implant. It kind of brought me back to my my origins where I used to just take the drill and just ever so gently, ever just just gently touch the end plates and soften it up, especially if there is a lot of sclerosis, which many times it, there is. And then it's pretty straightforward um, trial. In this instance, I cut and I put the implant in. So that's the end of my talk. I think you know we've come a long way. There's been a number of uh, incremental improvements with arthroplasty. Um, compression, I think, was, uh, you know, the claim to fame for the M6. And, uh, you know, there are other medic, other um, discs that do have compression. But I think I th a spine surgeon's alignment is intuitive to us. And I think that's where um, this implant is unique. And, and that's really been my journey with trying to solve a problem. So um, on that, I'll, I'll leave it and uh, stop sharing my screen. Neil, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're most welcome. Sorry, I'm musking around with the buttons. Um, <laughs> all right, excellent. Um, Neil, that was fantastic. I've got a couple of quick questions. 
sure. um, that's okay. Just on um, what we can with the TDR and the alignment um, issue, I am completely in agreement with you. I suppose what I'm interested in a little bit is about the sizing part mm -hmm. that you were talking about previously. And when we look at the sizing of your implant, I think you've got a five and a six. That's what you were saying. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of mm -hmm. the one you designed. So this implant, um, what happens in the patient with the very high domed, say C45? You know how often the, mm -hmm. uh, the you know, the dome of the uh, C4 uh, end plate will be quite significant, and particularly even C34, even more so. And how do you deal with that? So you know, um, I, I've had the privilege of seeing how different surgeons deal with it. Some surgeons will do a little flattening at the most anterior, most posterior part of it. Uh, a lot of them don't, and you'll see a gap, and then you'll see the, you know, the three months, six months, one year. And it's surprising. It fills, it just settles, and uh, the gap becomes less apparent. And um, I I'm not saying this is the, the one implant for every situation, but in the instances where I have seen that dome, um, I've been quite surprised to see it fill in. So I'm less fussed about it now than, than I used to be. And remember, we started off with a dome. So every time I look at a dome, I kind of cringe and say, well, should we have kept the dome? But I, I, um, I understand from an end. So I should say that, you know, brilliant people much smarter than I am. I've been lucky to be surrounded by, by them. They are the ones that did all the creation of what you're seeing when you put these implants in. And, and when they show you data that shows when you try with a dome and you put it into a flat end plate, what happens? Then there's risk of migration. Fortunately, we haven't had um, a device-related adverse event in 3,000 cases. So... I think it it speaks a little bit. It, it and I would say that you know if I compare this with an with a Moby C, there's certain advantages to distracting and popping it in, for example, um, and it does have a dome. But you're relying on that dome to keep it in there, and um, and so I I think we think a lot about it, but I I haven't seen the problem with it, Mike. But that's. I think you're on mute, my friend. Um, Dr. Advand Adresh is on the chat saying that Hi, how are you? He doesn't miss the dome. He's an expert. I'd love I'd love to hear his his opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Um I don't know. Uh, look, um if Arvand uh, can put in the chest text box if he's in a position to be able to have a chat, then we can uh, maybe amner our uh, Virtual Global Spine uh, host and outstanding fellow can uh, can help dial him in. But we've got a couple more minutes. Um, sure. I've, got, I've actually got a case that I put on the promo slide, Neil, and I just wanted to show you it quickly, if sure. that's okay. Is that all right? I Just, sure. uh, just to see what your thoughts on this are. Um, I'm just going to see if I can, can share... Okay, um, Neil, are you able to see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was a case that I was faced with a, a couple of years back, and um, oh, maybe eighteen months ago, actually. Um, anyway, it's a a long-standing patient of mine. Um, you can see on the um, side of the screen that she's had a scoliosis construct, which I did not do, um, and uh, she subsequently came with spondylolisthesis, and so that's my surgery at the very base of her spine there, and you can see that she's a relatively a hyper lordotic patient in the lumbar spine naturally, right from that long film. And then she's had a, a sort of old AOUSS construct in the thoracic spine. And that um, has flattened her, not terribly so, but you know, relative to her lumbar spine, that's really flattened her thoracic. And so she's kyphosing her neck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she's been doing this for a long time. So the long scully film is from three or four years ago. Uh, but a more recent plain film in neutral was the one um, 
uh, sort of on the uh, on the far side, and she came in with a combination of bilateral arm radiculopathy hmm. from the six seven disc protrusion and a okay. degenerate kyphotic disc at the level above. So this is a bit of a challenge. Bone scan was negative in the facets. Um, she does uh, not correct a lot in extension, like you can see on the MRI. So it's a relatively fixed kyphosis with no instability elsewhere. She's fused up to T4 already because of yeah. her thoracic fusion. And there's no way of changing that thoracic spine now, really. Um, no practical way of, of changing that alignment for the better. So, um, look, uh, I um, yeah, would you consider this patient as a candidate for synergy and uh i'm keen on um you know seeing or, or arthroplasty of any any type and i'm keen on um uh, other people's thoughts if anyone wants to put anything in the chat box but uh yeah so i mean <clears throat> five six and six five six looks a little bit more degenerated than six seven yeah, I mean, so five so, six is kyphotic with those big osteophytes, yeah. but the Raymond are relatively clear at that level. So that's like a chronic, um, you know, axial uh, issue that she's had that hadn't had surgery. I've been following this girl for over ten years, um, and uh, but the six seven was progressive bilateral foraminal stenosis. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess there's really. Th if you if you if you decided that surgery is is the right move, then you know option one you, you do a two level fusion, option two do a two level disc replacement, or option three go in between and do a hybrid, do six seven. Uh, 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 I think if there's no movement, uh, and I think you're going to have no. The other thing at five six, and the other thing is that the end plate of six, the superior end plate of six, is kind of a very odd shape yeah. and i'm a little concerned if you're putting a disc replacement in there you know you're really going to have to do a lot of carpentry to kind of make sure that you then the more you know um the more cancellous bone you expose and the higher risk of migration i, I might be tempted to put a lordotic do a lord a fusion uh with a lord lordotic inner body at five six and do a disc replacement at six seven and you could say, well, what are you protecting at six seven? I mean, there there is that you, because now you're going to place probably four or five at risk. But I think that would be usually it's the opposite, right? It's usually you put the the fusion at the bottom. But in this instance, yeah. I, think I would. Well, I think people do that for alignment issues as well. You know, we put the fusion at the bottom because we maybe believe, and it may be a false belief that we can get a bit more lordosis and kind of set up the rest of the neck with that. Sure. Um, yeah. So, yeah, look, I mean, this was a head scratcher for me and, and I went back and forth for a while. I, I did feel that both levels needed to be treated. And I thought that, um, you know, it was probably a bad idea to do uh, just a fusion, single level fusion at six, seven for this young lady, even though it was probably the dominant symptom level at that point. Um, and so, yeah, I, to back to my point about the dome, I'm yeah. always a bit anxious in when I, I use a flat end plate device you know, like M6, like Synergy, um, mm -hmm. of taking too much and then having not enough disc left to fill the space, essentially. Do you know what I mean? Like my carpentry, yeah. not quite. And so that, and I do like the concept of the end plate contact, but it's encouraging that you're getting cases where it all fills in. So yeah. I'll just quickly show you what I did for her because we're almost at the end uh, of the hour. Brilliant. So. I used a, an ESP, which is a highly constrained disc, and, and she has some features of minor ligamentous laxity. So I used the ESP at that uh, five six level to try to fill that dome that you were talking about. And right. then at, at six seven, I used a zero degree synergy because okay. I want to respect the fact that this girl's neck needs to be a little bit kyphotic. Okay. okay. Because of the thoracic spine that I can't change. So this was uh, a case which required a lot of thought. And um, some of the people I worked with said, oh, have you seen the Synergy zero degree? Because I didn't really want to put an ESP in that level and end up, you know, I really wanted to control how much angulation she had at that inferior level. So I've left her a bit kyphotic deliberately to match, to to compensate for the loss of thoracic kyphosis. And hopefully yeah, but... that's served her well. 
it's it's certainly improved from pre-op and uh and congratulations on the five six i mean um it, it 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 really looks very nice what you've done and uh and and has has have you been able to evaluate her motion does she have good yeah, she's got good motion at both this still but she's only 18 months out right so yeah i think a time will tell uh basically well we did a study and and it, it showed that usually by you know 12 months um there there are going to be these long so there's you know kind of these two groups of patients one group of patients um, lose their motion very early on, and then others are just a pure function of time. So I've seen cases now almost you know, 15, 16 years, and they still have motion. So early on, if you see loss of motion, okay, well, that's obvious. But a lot of times, if you're at 18 months and they're still moving well, there, and there's no obvious issue there, I would say that more likely than not, they'll continue to, to, to move well in, in the future. And uh, especially you did a lot of work on at five, six. And if, if it's still moving, that's great. You did a lot, yeah, of, a lot of bone wax and all those tricks you're talking about. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was just, you know, I was a little uncomfortable with leaving the dome gap there. So I used a domed implant, but likewise, you know, I'm a bit uncomfortable using the ESP where there's really flat implant uh, end plates as well. So I've been trying to mix and match them. Hence I use a, a huge variety of these devices, but uh yeah, uh, I think that's the name of the game, right? Uh, and it's, you know, what do you get predictable results with? And, you know, there's no one size fits all. Um, and if 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 you're happy with domed um, implants, then certainly you're getting great, great results. So that's, that's yeah, great. I was happy with both here, Neil, but uh, thank you very much for your talk today. I think we've just clicked over the hour. I don't have any more questions on the chat box. Um, I do uh, have, um, uh, I don't have any uh, of the other faculty here letting me know what's happening next week, but we will be on again at the same time next week. It'll be advertised on Twitter and LinkedIn and, and the socials. And uh, But if you do have any questions uh, for Neil or myself, if you uh, you can post on LinkedIn or Twitter and, uh, and ask away and we'll get back to you about them. I think you know, most of us that do this kind of work are always happy to give some advice on what is possible uh, and uh, and what you can do with these implants, um, you know, always people are sending me messages. I'm happy to give advice. So, yeah, I, uh, thank you for uh, your time today, everyone. Neil, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate. My pleasure. Everything. Thank you, Mike. Great, great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. We'll see you next week.